right. Well, this morning we're continuing in our verse-by-verse study through the book of 1 Peter. We find ourselves this morning at chapter 3, uh, chapter 3, uh, verse, verses 1 and 2. Now, over the past number of weeks, we have been able to identify the thought that is central on the mind of the Apostle Peter. And whenever we're studying God's Word, that's the aim, isn't it? where we're trying to understand through careful interpretation, trying to understand what was the thought, the original thought, uh, and what was the original intended meaning of the person who first penned what we have before us here. And we've seen over the last few weeks that the central thought on the Apostle Peter's mind, it has to do with the subject matter of submission. That is the central thought on his mind. Or we could put it this way. What Peter has been helping us to understand is that one of the identifying marks of a true follower of Jesus Christ is that they should have a submissive attitude, a submissive attitude towards the authorities whom God has placed within their own lives. And what Peter has done is that he's helped to illustrate this because it's one thing to just say, hey, Christian, have a submissive attitude. But we need a little bit more application. We need a bit more instruction as to, well, what it is that actually looks like in our lives as Christians. And this is what Peter has sought to do over the last number of weeks. We saw, first of all, that Peter illustrated for us what this should look like to have a submissive attitude towards our governing authorities. He's helped us to understand what the submissive attitude should look like towards our government, those who govern our country. He then moved on, secondly, to illustrate what submission should look like in terms of our attitudes towards our masters or employers, those who we work for. And that's where we got to last week, where Peter says, this is what it looks like, the submissive attitude in the life of a believer in terms of the workplace. Now, of course, when we cross-reference with other scripture, we know that there are other realms of life in which submission or a submissive attitude is required of us as Christians. For instance, in Ephesians chapter 6, we read that children are to submit to the authority of their parents. So that's another realm of life in which submissive, a submissive attitude is required. Then in Hebrews chapter 13, we're told that church members, church members are to submit to their church elders. So again, different realms where a submissive attitude is required for us as Christians. Whereas in today's passage, what we do is we simply see Peter illustrating for us what what submission should look like in yet another realm of life. This time it has to do within the context of the marriage relationship. Now, of course, the subject matter that we are confronted with here, it really has to do with God's design for marriage. This is what we're thinking about, how God has designed the marriage relationship, but more specifically, it has to do with the distinct roles and responsibilities between a man and a woman within their marriage relationship. Now, it's important for us to recognize that what the Bible teaches about the roles of of men and women within their marriage, it is very, very clear. It's very, very clear what it is that God has in mind when he gives to us instruction from his word. There is no ambiguity. There is no vagueness when it comes to the roles and the responsibilities of men and women within marriage. In other words, if you put together all of the passages on the subject, well, you're not left with any doubt. You're not left with any uncertainty as to what the mind of Christ has to say about this subject matter. You see, right throughout church history, the biblical role distinctions between men and women, they have been the norm in Christian families and within the church. Now, I'm not saying they were illustrated perfectly within families and churches throughout church history, but there have been distinctions which have been present. That is, until the last century, with the rise of the feminist movement. Up until that point, there was no dispute, no misunderstanding as to what the Bible teaches. Again, because it's very, very clear. It's not vague. There's no ambiguity in in the mind of, of God from his word. But with the rise of the feminist movement, many women have successfully 
influenced, have been successfully influenced to abandon any role distinctions, any of their God-given role distinctions. And instead, what they have done is that they have traded them in for something that is less than God's best. But not only has the feminist movement invaded our culture, it has also successfully made it into the Christian family, and it is also, with the feminist movement's ideas, it has successfully made these ideas, made its way right into the church. And as it is with most false teaching, and I'll call it false teaching, uh, that's not too strong of a word, as it is with most false teaching, what the feminist movement has done it is, it has turned something which is crystal clear in the Word of God, and it has turned it into something that is chaotic. It has turned it into something which is confusing. For many Christians today, we don't even realize to what extent our thinking has been influenced by this false teaching from our society through this feminist movement. All we know is that when we come to a passage such as we have here before us today, all we know is that Perhaps even within some of us today, there's almost like an automatic resistance to it. Am I not correct? Is there not somewhat of an automatic resistance or, hang on a minute, what's happening here? Wow, this is a big, heavy topic. No, it's not. This is just marriage 101. This is just the way that God created it right from the very beginning. This is not complicated. This is not chaotic. This is not confusing. And if we come to a passage like we have today and we go, ooh, wow, this is a big topic. Or if we think to ourselves, ooh, there's a bit of resistance to what it is that we see, we just have to recognize that we have been influenced by the feminist movement within our society and perhaps it's crept right into our own thinking. Again, not because of what scripture teaches is unclear, but because of with so many other things, our thinking has been so influenced by the wrong ideas from our culture. Now, it's important for us to note that before the rise of the feminist movement, well, things were not exactly the way that they should have been in terms of the recognition and in terms of the appreciation of women. Okay? We get that clear. Just just as things in the culture were not the way that they should have been in the days of Jesus. Women were not appreciated. They were not recognized. They were not esteemed in the way that the Word of God teaches And so I want us to be very clear right at the very beginning that in no way, shape, or form am I suggesting at all that we should go back to exactly the way that things were before the rise of the feminist feminist movement. But what is abundantly clear is that something was most certainly lost within our culture. There was something most certainly lost within our culture due to the feminist movement. We have lost somewhat those God-given role distinctions. Instead of going back to some point in time, what we really need to go back to is the Word of God. That is our starting place. When things in society are confusing, when roles and genders and things of this nature, when, when things are confusing, the only way that we can go back, or the only place, the only anchor that we can come back to to try to be, know that we're thinking correctly is the Word of God. Because in the Bible alone, we discover God's best in terms of role distinctions between men and women, and specifically role distinctions between men and women within their marriage. Now, there's a, there's a fair bit to cover. There's a fair bit to cover on this subject, both biblically and practically. And so we're going to have to split this study into several parts. Um, I'm not prepared to kind of tell you how many parts at this point. <laughs> I know it's going to go beyond this Sunday. And we will definitely be into next Sunday, but I'm not quite prepared to sort of put the aim, my, my stake in the ground and say it's going to be capped at two Sundays. Maybe it will. You have to come along next week and see. Um, and so, but what we are, it'll have several parts to it. And over the next several studies, what we're going to be really looking at is five main things, five main things that we want to cover in terms of a wife's submission within her marriage. What are those five things over the this season of looking through um, the subject of a wife's submission within marriage. Well, number one, we're going to be taking a look at the principle of submission. Number two, we're going to be looking at the extent of submission. So the principle of submission, that's God's design for marriage, that which was ordained right from the very beginning. Then secondly, the extent of submission. You know, is it just 
you know, um, unending submission, blind submission, 100 total percent submission? Well, no, it it is not that. And so we want to talk about the extent of submission within a marriage relationship and what submission does not mean. That's very important. Thirdly, we're going to take a look at the practicalities of submission, what embracing a husband's headship entails. Fourthly, we're going to take a look at the power of submission, which is a, a fruitful Christian witness. And fifthly, we're going to take a look at the supplements of submission, the additional attributes which are to accompany a wife's submission within her marriage. As for today, which of these points are we going to be covering? Well, today we are only going to be able to look at the very first point, and that is the principle of submission. So in terms of the wider outline of the series of, of, this series of looking at this idea of a wife's submission in marriage, today we are specifically looking at the principle of of submission. Now, as it is with most things, when we begin to look at this, the principle of submission, as with most things, it's, it's always good to start from the beginning. Our, our thinking needs to start from the beginning. And the very first thing that we see that Scripture teaches on the subject of men and women is that men and women are equally created in the image of God. That is the starting place. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let let them have dominion dominion over the, the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. Now, what this tells us is that at the beginning, when God created man and woman, neither man nor woman received more of the image of God than the other. In terms of their value, in terms of their worth as image bearers of God, neither man nor woman were created more superior than the other. Right from the very beginning, we see an equality in terms of gender, an equality of sexes, in terms of their persons, in terms of them as spiritual beings before God, men and women were, were created can completely equal in terms of being image bearers of God. Yet, without making one inferior, to the other, God has purposed for there to be differences between the roles and the responsibilities of husbands and wives. What we see at the beginning is that God did not create man and woman at the same time, but instead he created Adam first. And before Eve was created, God had given to Adam a mandate. He had given to Adam authority. He gave him a mandate and he gave him authority to have dominion over the whole earth. And some of the outworking of that dominion, some of the outworking of that authority had to do with him naming all the animals, all the beings that were on the earth. And by the way, in case you're wondering, Adam with that authority also named Eve. He says... This is woman. <laughs> he gave her, gave her a name. Right from the beginning, authority was given. We see in Genesis chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air, brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. Now, this is very interesting, because as Adam is there, naming and peering up animals, he would have quickly realized, hey, they all seem to have peers. There seems to be a male and a female with everyone, but then it only emphasized the fact that, hey, I'm not peered up with anyone. (laughs) He's looking around, he's going, that giraffe doesn't look comparable to me. (laughs) 
that rhinoceros certainly is not (laughs) going to be my mate for life, my helpmate. And so God kind of allowed Adam to go through and to name every single creature and to see them paired up and to see them all together and realizing that there was a need in his life. He was not complete. There was something more that was required. And God could have just done that. God could have just created them at the same time and God could have said, hey, don't worry, we've got, you know, we've got someone coming, you know, your way, just hang in there. But he didn't. He allowed for Adam to kind of see it for himself realized that, hey, you know what? Out of all the animals, out of all the, 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 the beings that are here on earth, uh, the animal order, well, there is no one for me. There needs to be something brought into creation for me. I need to have what it is that everyone, every of these animals have around, around me. And so it's for this reason we read in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone I will make a helper comparable to him. And so what do we see? We see at the very beginning that God did not create man and woman at the same time. Instead, what did he do? He created Adam first, and he created Eve later. When he first created Adam, well, he gave Adam the mandate. He gave him authority. He gave him dominion. And then he created Eve later for the specific purpose of being Adam's helper, to come alongside, to be in support, to be working towards the same goal, yet acknowledging there was a distinction there in place. Eve was equal to Adam, equal to Adam in terms of being an image bearer of God, but she was given a role and a responsibility to come alongside Adam to support him and to assist him. It wasn't the other way around. Adam was not created to come under the leadership of Eve. Eve was to come, was created to come under the leadership in that assisting role to come alongside Adam. This is just the order. This is just the biblical order. There's no dispute with this. This is the order that we see that God brought this into creation. Now, Paul puts it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 8 and 9. He says, For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. And it was at this point in time, right at the very, very beginning, within the very first marriage union, that God gave to Adam the authority and also the responsibility of leadership. At the same time, God gave to Eve the responsibility to recognize Adam's leadership by helping him in it and submitting it to it. Now, some might object to this and say, well, you know what, Jason, I don't see the words authority and I don't see the words submission within those texts of Scripture within Genesis. And, well, the answer to that question is that, yeah, you're you're correct. However, the principles, the principles of authority and submission, they are implied, and we know this because we know that New Testament writers, when talking about authority and submission in in terms of men and women, in terms of the marriage relationship, will often point back to the creative order. And we we know in the heart of God, they are implied. We know this as well by using the synthesis principle of interpretation, which is simply cross-referencing by looking, well, let's take a look at this. Let's put this to the test. Is this what really took place at the very beginning in the book of Genesis in terms of role distinctions and role responsibilities? Well, when we take and we cross-reference with other places of Scripture, we see it specifically talk about the marriage relationship between a man and a woman. And what we see in passages within Scripture is that the husband is given responsibility and the authority to lead within his marriage, And the wife is given the responsibility to support and to submit to her husband's leadership by assisting him in it, not just saying, well, that's good for you, big guy, go and do your thing and I'll be at home. No, 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 no. Responsibility to submit, to acknowledge and to assist and to come alongside and to help her husband in that leadership. For instance, in the teaching about marriage and the marriage relationship, Paul instructs in Ephesians chapter 5, 
verses 22 to 24, he says very explicitly, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. And then to make the, to reinforce the point even further, he says in verse 24, therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their husbands in everything. Now, there are some who object to this particular text of Scripture. Again, very clear, isn't it? It's very clear what's being said here. But there are some who object to this by pointing to the previous verse, and that is in verse 21. They would say that Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, neutralizes any kind of authority or submission or role distinctions within marriage. Because what does Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 say? It says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. That's what the text says. And then the very next verse, in verse 22, it's, wives, submit to your own husbands. And so there are some who take Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 to mean that a wife doesn't need to submit to her husband because after all, look at what it says in verse 21. It says that we are to what? We're supposed to submit to one another. Friends, can I just tell you that, that that argument does not hold a single drop of water? Because verse 21, in verse 21, what Paul does is that he establishes the principle of submission, submitting to one another in the fear of God. The principle of submission is established, isn't it? But then you look at verse 22 right through to, to, to chapter 6, verse 9, we see that Paul then explains the outworking of, of what submission is to look like in the various relationships within our lives. The principle is established in verse 21. And then he goes right through and he says, this is what it looks like here. And this is what it looks like there. And here's what it looks like over here. And what Paul does in Ephesians chapter 5 is that he articulates firstly what submission looks like within the marriage relationship. That a wife is to submit to her husband. And what's interesting is the comparison that Paul actually gives between the, the, the husband's headship over the wife, comparing that to Christ's headship over the church. When it says that Christ is the head of the church, that does not mean that sometimes the church submits to Christ and sometimes Christ submits to the church. That, that, that's not what it means. Christ's headship over the church means that he is the authority over the church and the church's responsibility is what? The church's responsibility is to simply recognize that authority, to come under that authority, to submit to that authority. And in a similar way, this is what it's to look like in a marriage relationship with a husband as the head. Well, then if you look in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, six verses 1 to 4, Paul moves on to talking about the, the principle of submission in the marriage relationship, and instead he moves over to the parent-child relationship. It says that a pair, that a child is to, you know, obey. What is that? Submit. There's submission there. The authority of the parents, because this is right. Again, does verse 21 and the, 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 previous, the previous chapter, does that kind of neutralize the authority of a parent? Is the parent meant to, some, is the child meant to sometimes submit to the parent and sometimes the parent is to submit to the child? Because after all, that's what it says in verse 21, right? No one talks about that, right? So, uh, oh, no. In the marriage, it's all kind of neutralized now because, after all, we have verse 21 here. Submit to one another. Oh, yeah, well, how's that working out with your, the, the raising of your children? When was the last time you submit to your children? You know, well, unfortunately, that is the case in, 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 in some, in, with some parents, but that's not the intended idea of what's being talked about here in the text. Then Ephesians chapter 6. Verses 5 to 8, well, Paul then talks about submission and how that's to be played out within the workplace. Again, think about it. Is Paul saying that sometimes the boss gets to tell you what to do and sometimes you get to tell the boss what to do? You know, submitting to one another, right? Verse 21. No, that's not what Paul is meaning. Anyone who has tried to tell their boss what to do, I, I, I know that you'll be unemployed right now. <laughs> that's not what Paul's trying to say here. Of course it's not. Verse 21 does not neutralize what it is that Paul, that Paul teaches in the verses that follow. But you see, in addition to Ephesians chapter 5, one that gets disputed at times, well, there's also Colossians chapter 3, 
verse 18. Another passage that helps us to understand God's intention for there to be authority and submission between a husband and wife within the marriage relationship. Colossians chapter 3, verse 18 says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Then we get to places such as Titus chapter 2, verse 5. And in Titus chapter 2, verse 5, what Paul is giving instruction to Titus about is saying, Titus, I want you to instruct some of the older, more mature believers, believing women within your congregation. And I want you to exhort them and instruct them to, they have to instruct the younger woman within the church. And Paul says to Titus, here are some areas in which I want you to tell the older, mature woman as to how it is that they had to instruct the younger Christian woman within the church. And as we're going to see, one of the things on that list is to teach the younger woman to have a submissive attitude towards their husbands. Let's read the text. He says, The older woman likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may admonish the young woman to love their husbands, love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, and here it is, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Friends, when we think about it, and we go right back to the very beginning, we see here within the word of God that the Bible establishes both the equality of men and women, but it also establishes the support role of the wife. There is equality, yet there are role distinctions or role and responsibility distinctions within the marriage. Without making one inferior to the other, God calls upon both husbands and wives to fulfill their God-given roles and responsibilities that God has specifically designed for them. You want a perfect illustration of this? Well, the perfect illustration of what this, is, what this looks like has to be the Trinity. It's got to be in the Trinity. Because what you have in the Trinity is that you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they are all equally God. There is not one person in the Godhead that is less God or one that is more God within the Trinity. Yet, yet at the same time, although they are all equally God, there are defined distinctions in which the way in which the way that the, the, the Godhead functions together. We know this just from a re- redemptive point of view, that we have been purposed by the Father. We have been purchased by the Son. We have been preserved by the Holy Spirit. We see one God, different roles and responsibilities, just the illustration, just in the redemptive order that God has in place. And so we can kind of see a model of how this can look. Because the Father didn't lay down His life, because the Spirit didn't lay down His life for the people of God, it doesn't make the Son any less or more God. He's still equally God, but just different in roles and responsibilities. Now, another important point for us to recognize is this, is that a husband's headship in marriage is not the result of sin, because it was established by God even before the fall. Why is this important? Well, this is important to understand because, again, there are some people that object to a husband's headship because they will say, it was the result of sin. It was the result of the curse in the Garden of Eden. So that, now that a woman becomes a Christian, she is no longer under the curse anymore, is she? And therefore, she is no longer to, required to submit to her husband now that they are, uh, they are now to have both equal authority within the marriage. Well, firstly, we need to recognize that God purposed for Eve to be Adam's helper or help meet even before the fall. <laughs> it happened even before the fall, even before the curse. But in addition to this, we see, and this is, care, this is, this is important, We see in the New Testament epistles that, by the way, are written to who? To believers who are no longer under the curse, right? We see in New Testament epistles that the principles of authority and submission in marriage are still very much applicable. 
If authority and submission within a marriage relationship was a result of the curse, then we wouldn't expect to see them written in the New Testament epistles, which are written to those who are no longer under the curse. But as we've seen already in 1 Corinthians 11, Ephesians chapter 5, Colossians chapter 3, Titus chapter 2, and also in our passage today of 1 Peter chapter 3, all of these commands are so explicitly still present, which tells us what? It tells us that the role distinctions that God has established before the curse are still applicable beyond the cross. Friends, that's what it tells us. It tells us that the role distinctions and the role responsibilities between men and women that God created before the curse, they are still now applicable beyond the cross. In saying this, the fall, the fall introduced distortions. It introduced distortions to the role distinctions between husbands and wives. Adam and Eve's disobedience right there in the Garden of Eden Disobedience to God's command, it resulted in certain consequences. And for the woman, we're told of those consequences in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. It says, To the woman he said, God said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. So, In addition to pain and childbirth, God also declares that there would be a tension in the authority-submission relationship between a husband and wife as the result of a curse. How so? Well, look at it in your Bibles there in verse 16, um, or on the screen in verse 16 there. It says that a woman's desire would be for her husband, but that he would rule over her. Now, what what does the word desire mean? I mean, that sounds like it's something quite good in a sense. Oh, she desires her husband. My wife desires me. What's the big deal with that? Well, the next chapter over in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, the same Hebrew word desire is used, and it's used to mean excessive control over. That's what the word means, excessive control over. And so as part of the curse in relation to women, is that she would have now a new desire to want to exercise control over her husband. A wife's willingness to submit to her husband's authority would be replaced with a sinful, and I do say sinful because that's the only word that we can use to describe it, a sinful desire to resist her husband's authority. That's what was brought about by the curse. Well, how about the word rule in relation to the husband? It says in verse 16 that the husband would rule over his wife. The word rule literally means to dominate. So you have a wife, because of the curse, who wants to excessively control her husband, and now you have a husband exercising his his headship in a dominating kind of way. Instead of a husband exercising his headship in a humble, loving manner, well, the curse would result in husbands dominating their wives in a a harsh, uncaring, selfish kind of way. I mean, even in Jesus' day, the the, the Greeks, the Romans, the Jewish uh, cultures, they viewed women almost on the same level as one's possessions, The Jewish rabbis in the day of Jesus, they forbid the the Talmud to be read to women, saying that it was better to burn the Torah than to teach the word of God to women. Women were not included in times of corporate worship. They were sectioned off as second-class citizens. Women were thought of as second-class citizens, and there was very little love and care and respect for women in that day. But friends, from the beginning, this was never God's intention. This was never motivated or brought about by the heart of God. Again, God created man and woman as equals, yet with just different, distinct roles and responsibilities. But but what the curse did is that the curse distorted. It distorted the beautiful, complementary balance of the roles of men and women within the marriage relationship. That is what the curse did. However, 
the good news, the good news is that redemption in Christ, it removes all those distortions from the curse, demonstrating how equality and submission can exist side by side. That's what redemption in Christ does. What the cross of Christ identifies for us is this. It identifies for us that the way of salvation is equally the same for both men and women. And that through the cross, men and women share an equal standing as members of the body of Christ before the Savior who saved them. I mean, this is the the heart of the Apostle Paul as he explains in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 28. He puts it so beautifully. He says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Wow. Wow. Think how radical this sounds. Think about those who look down at at women as second-class citizens for the Jews who excluded women from joining men in their times of worship and teaching. Think about the Jews who thought that they were more superior spiritually compared to women. Well, what is the Apostle Paul telling us here? He is telling us here that the cross of Christ eradicates any kind of that sinful way of thinking. It levels out the playing ground in terms of one standing before the Lord Jesus. A man is not more superior. A man is not of greater importance or or greater value than a woman within the body of Christ. A, A man needs to admit his sin. A man needs to trust in Christ the same way that a woman does. And when, by the way, when a man admits his sin and, and, and places his confidence and trust in the Lord Jesus, a man's position before Christ is no more or no less than a woman's position before Christ. This, my friends, is just one of the wonderful, wonderful truths of the gospel. One of the wonderful truths about salvation. The equality of one's person is restored at the cross of Jesus Christ. He is the one who has reversed that curse of looking at one another in a way in which is not fitting. But you see, not only does the cross restore the equality of the personhood between men and women, it also restores the authority, submission, relationship, and marriage to what it should have been, to what God always intended it to be. He not only restores the personhood that men and women are equally loved, cared for, valued in the eyes of God, but through the cross, God also restores the authority and submission within marriage. Remember, the result of the curse caused distortion in God's design with women wanting to resist the husband's authority, with the husband exercising his headship in a way that was dominating, harsh, uncaring. You see, some people take passages like Galatians chapter 3, and you'll hear this one all the time, you know, you'll hear this one thrown around all the time. They'll take Galatians chapter 3 verse 28, and they'll say, well, it says, there is neither male nor female, you are all one in Christ. And instead of taking this to mean that both men and women have an equal standing before God at the foot of the cross, those who have been influenced by feminism, they take this to mean that role distinctions between men and women have now been eradicated at the cross. No more distinctions at all. But friends, can I just ask the question, is this the original tended meaning of what Paul was trying to communicate? When you read through Galatians, the book of Galatians, you read through chapter 3, is this what we say, see here? Is, is the main theme of the book of Galatians trying to say that, hey, you know, the cross abolishes God's original design for marriage? Is that what's on the mind of the Apostle Paul when you're reading through Galatians chapter 3 in particular? Is, is Paul teaching that the cross removes all authority and, so, and res- responsibilities of authority and responsibility of a husband's headship? Is, it, is Paul saying, hey, guess what? Now that you're saved, it doesn't really matter what you do, husband. Just carry on. There's no leadership required of you. 
Is Paul teaching in Galatians chapter 3 that, hey, the cross removes the necessity of a wife acknowledging, recognizing her husband's headship and coming and submitting and, and helping and assisting his leadership? Well, friends, the answer to that question is no. There's no way that a person could correctly and consistently interpret the word of God and, and apply those same principles to that passage and come out with that kind of result. Paul is not seeking to cover every single aspect of God's design for males and females within marriage when he penned what it is that he penned here in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Neither is he talking about how a Christian marriage is to function. If you ask anyone, what is the book of Galatians about? What is chapter 3 in the book of Galatians about? No one is ever going to tell you it's about God's design for marriage. No one will find that. No one throughout church history has, has thought of that, not until the rise of the feminist movement, we say, hey, this looks like a pretty handy proof text to me. Now I can ad adopt the feminist thinking of the world and I, I have a verse I can point to. Can I just say, no, you don't. <laughs> you don't have a verse to point to. He's not talking about how a Christian marriage is to function. Instead, Paul is explaining that both men and women have equal standing before God when they place their faith in Christ. And you only have to use, again, the synthesis principle of interpretation, which is cross-referencing, cross-referencing to other New Testament passages that talk about marriage. And when we do so, what do we see? We see that the cross does not abolish role distinctions, but instead the cross restores role distinctions to what God always intended for them to be. My friends, listen to this. Here's something practical for you. For the Christian wife, she is no longer under the curse. And because the Christian wife is no longer under the curse, well, she is to no longer resist the, her husband's headship. But instead, she is to submit to her husband's headship. For the Christian husband, he is no longer under the curse either. And so number one, the husband is to, number one, exercise leadership for those who aren't. But as he does so, he is not to exercise his headship and his authority in such a way that is harsh and dominating. But he is to exercise his headship within his marriage in love. What did Paul say in Ephesians chapter five? Loving your wife as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Do we get the picture? According to Scripture, the cross does not eradicate role distinctions. It restores role distinctions to what it is that God always intended for them to be. My friends, do not buy into the false teaching of the feminist agenda that many in the wider church today have bought into in one way or another. For a husband to exercise his God-given responsibility in providing leadership to his family, for a wife to exercise her God-given responsibility and supporting her husband's leadership role, helping him with it, submitting to it. These role distinctions are not demeaning towards women, nor do they diminish a wife's equality. But instead, they're simply a picture. They're a picture of God's beautiful design for how he has purposed for marriage to function. Two equals but with two distinct God-given roles and responsibilities. When husbands and wives follow God's blueprint, husbands and wives follow God's design for marriage, they will have a blessed marriage. But when husbands and wives seek to abolish God's design because of the feminist agenda and buying into the feminist agenda thinking, then in essence... If they abolish, if they push aside God's design, in essence, they may think that they're being progressive. They may think that they're kind of moving forward in their thinking, but what they're really doing is that they're putting their relationship back under the curse of what it was before Christ. Which is what? Before Christ, it was husbands not leading properly and wives not acknowledging their husband, husband's authority. But friends, what has Christ done? Christ has reversed the curse. 
And so it's important for us to understand now how this relates to the relationship between husbands and wives. I think one of the points that we're going to see as we continue in the weeks ahead is that a house divided amongst itself will not stand. And that is most certainly true in every realm of life, whether it be the workplace, whether it be within the community group, whether it be within the church, and how especially is it true within a marriage. God's wisdom is saying, a house divided among, uh, against itself shall not stand. When you have people not functioning in the way that God has intended it to happen, it will not stand. And that's why we see so much dysfunction today within marriages within the body of Christ. But when we push aside the feminist agenda, when we say, okay, I know the rest of the culture and I know the, a good part of the church culture today is heading in this direction and, and, and distorting things, but no, I'm going to keep on the track that God's word says, my friends, you will have a blessed marriage, an incredibly blessed marriage, a unified marriage, a marriage which has been defined and designed and, and blessed by the true and the living God, the one who's given us the blueprints here in the first place. Friends, as we begin thinking about the subject of a wife's submission in marriage, this is the place to start. We start, as we have this morning, reminding ourselves that the principle of submission within marriage, it is taught within the word of God. This is not some kind of idea that has been created by some chauvinistic men, but this is an idea that has been ordained by God from the beginning from a very wise and sovereign God. He knew when he created Adam and Eve, he knew what he needed to do in order that thousands of years later that you, my marriage and your marriage and maybe your future marriage can be blessed. Wise and sovereign God. He knew exactly how to design it. God is the one who ordained marriage. He is the one who designed for how marriages are to function in order for there to be harmony. Don't we want harmony? Harmony within marriage, harmony between the couples themselves. Because friends, can I just say when a, a marriage is divided? Can I just say that when a marriage, there's just the role distinctions have been abolished and there's just butting heads all the time. Can I just say that that does not bring glory to God? A disharmony, a disharmony within marriage does not bring glory to God. But when the husband and the wife will come and see what the word of God says, and they will submit to what the word of God says. There is harmony. And when there is harmony in the marriage, it is a picture of Christ in the church. And when there is a picture of Christ in the church, well, then you have much glory being given to God. My friends, let's be thankful today. Let's be thankful to God for this particular season we have embarked on now, knowing that God knows that our marriages, or our future marriages, they need encouragement. They need enrichment. And what's more, God has provided to us passages like 1 Peter chapter 3, which we will get into probably more specifically the text next week. And he's given us this text to accomplish this very task, to enrich our marriages. You want some marriage enrichment? Well, you can either go away on a marriage weekend or you can come to church for the next few weeks because that's what the Word of God is going to be providing for us. As we spend a number of weeks looking at the wife's, wife's role in marriage, then we move on to the husband's role in marriage. My friends, Let's embrace this season. Let's embrace it as something that God has actually brought about in his infinite wisdom. I mean, this is not some series that we've just kind of decided to force in or ram in or insert into our teaching schedule. This is just where we're up to in terms of our systematic teaching through the word of God. Today, we have looked at what? The principle of submission. We'll then continue on with the extent of submission, the practicalities of submission, the power of submission, and the supplements of submission. Now, again, you might be thinking to yourself again this morning, hey, you know what? I'm not married. I don't know how this can be relevant to me. Can I just say that if you're not married, if you'd like to be, use this as a season of preparation. Prepare your thoughts so that you can hit the ground running when God brings along Mr. or Mrs. Wright, God willing, one day. For some of you, it's going to be sooner rather than later. I won't name any names. Um, <laughs> Use this as a time to recalibrate your thinking as to what it is that God has to say about the subject. And again, if you're in a season where it's very unlikely 
that you will be married or remarried in the case of the death, death of a spouse. Again, use this teaching series as something that's just as important for you, knowing that as a member in the body of Christ, you have a responsibility to give biblical counsel to others within the body of Christ as and when you see that you need them. And can I just say that if, even if you're older or if it's unlikely that you, you're going to get married, we, God can still use your voice to help to encourage and point younger couples to the Word of God to bring about that harmony and God's design within their marriage. So use this opportunity um, in that kind of way as well. So before uh, we, we, Sam comes forward and leads us in a time of the Lord's Supper, let's just commit this time now to a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for your, for your word. We know that a house divided amongst its, itself, it will not stand. And we don't want that to be true of any marriage within our church. There is no need for that to be uh, uh, the issue for any, any marriage within our church. Not that marriage is easy, not that there are not problems to, to work through and to get to at that place. Um, but Lord, please use this season, myself included, my wife and I included, use it, Lord. Use it so that we can that we can better understand your design, your purposes, um, how it is to be worked out practically um, in our lives and, and help us to come to your word with, a, with an attitude of humility, knowing that where there is changes to be made, that we'd be willing to make those changes, that we wouldn't resist your word because of the wrong thinking of our culture, but that we would simply respond rightly to the word of God. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.